many times that we only focus on the vastness of who God is and <clears throat> the incredibleness of His almighty power, but I've said it a bunch of times, and I know many other preachers have, I am thankful that the God we serve not only saved the world, but He saved me as an individual. I'm thankful that the God of the universe is not just the God of the universe, but He's my friend. Somebody else in the house? Anybody else in the house? Thankful that the God of the universe just doesn't know the times and the signs and doesn't just have a hold on the future, but He knows me as an individual, and He loves me still. Amen? Loves me still. His eyes on the spare. We're going to be in the book of Job this morning. Job chapter 1. Job chapter number 1. Job chapter number 1. Familiar story. I'm sure everybody has heard this story of Job. I uh, had a new convert one time, Brother Dennis, when I was a young preacher. And um, he said, Preacher, can you tell me what's going on in the book of Job over there? Is that about employment? What else has that got going on there? The guy's name's Job. It's long O. Um, it's a story of somebody who fell on hard times. It's a story of someone who is probably the great example of what we might consider the complete 180, 360 story that goes from a hero to a zero and then back up. It's the ultimate underdog where he goes from having everything to having nothing to having everything plus some again. If it was made into some sort of fairy tale book, it would be a pump up, energetic, you can do it, motivational, look what this guy's been through and he made it. Everybody likes stories like that, all right? And God put one of these in the Bible, and it's a real-life story of a man named Job. Let's all stand this morning if you find your place. Job chapter 1. I'm only going to read a few verses, and then I'll tell you the story. If you don't believe me, you can ask anybody that reads the Bible. They'll collaborate what I say. Job chapter 1, verse 1, if you're there, say amen this morning. The Bible says, and there was a man in the land of us. Now, I don't have time to go into this this morning. I had a professor in college. He was wonderful, Brother Barry. And uh, he stopped every time he read that passage of Scripture. And he said, there was a man. Understand that Job would have never made it through this story if he wasn't a real man. Somebody help me out. Amen? Three of you. That's just great. And we don't have any real men in the house. I said he would not have made it through if he wasn't a real man. Guys, we are destitute in our society of real men. And I don't mean scratching, sniffing, spitting men. I'm talking about men that lead uh, by example. Somebody say amen. I, this is not what I'm going to preach, but if you're going to go sissified on me, I'm going to stay right here. Everybody okay? Stop complaining about the women and the children and lead from the front. Guys, that's where you say amen, all right? The Bible says, and there was a man in the land of us. It's a weird name for a hometown. His name was Job. The Bible says, and that man was perfect and upright. Now you say, whoa, back up, preacher, can't get there. He's already perfect. None of us are perfect. The word doesn't mean he was without spot or blemish. It means one of the definitions, he was complete. He was balanced. Uh, you would say that this man had it together. He was upright. He was somebody who was well-respected. Do you know anybody this morning that you look up to? That was Job. People looked up. To Job. The scripture said he was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. He eschewed evil. He shoot it away like a fly. Get away from me, shoe fly. Don't you remember that song? Shoe fly, don't bother me. Yeah, get away from me. Get away from me. I got I ain't got time for that. He didn't entertain evil. Get away. Verse 2, the Bible says, And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. I have a lot of kids at my house. But ten children would be redonkulous. Everybody okay? Can you imagine feeding ten kids? Somebody say amen, right? Some of you may have children that eat like ten children, all right? But he had ten kids, three girls and seven boys. The scripture says, And his substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxygen, 500 she-asses in a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. Let me break that down for you in country vernacular. He be rich. Somebody say amen. All right. He's wealthy. He has a lot of money. He rolls deep. I must talk to the teenagers for a minute. He got stacks. Everybody all right? He, he, okay. Y'all know what I'm talking about. All right. This guy has got wealth. All right. A lot of wealth. 
We might say that he has stupid money. Anybody know? I'm not, nobody knows what I'm talking about. Everybody, some of you older guys, what is this guy talking about? I mean, he has got, he's got together, all right? He's got a lot of money. The scripture says, and his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for the three sisters to eat and to drink with them. So his kids are throwing a party. And it was so the days that they were feasting and going about that Job sent and sanctified them. Notice what the Bible says. And he rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. That's ten. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And thus did Job. Here's a dad that sacrificed on the premise that his kids might sin. He didn't even know about it. He said, I'm just going to go ahead and offer some sacrifices just in case they violated anything. This is a righteous man. This is a man who went into his prayer closet because he knows that his kids were human beings. Somebody say amen right there. I mean, y'all are dead. I said, somebody help me out. He knew his kids were sinners, right? He said, I didn't hear about anything, but before I hear about it, I'm going to cover it in the blood. Everybody all right? Pretty impressive father. Pretty impressive gentleman. The Bible says, and there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. We don't have time to get into the theology of here, but the devil still has to give account for what he does on the earth. Now, y'all get excited about that. I love it when I start. I'm going to help you. I said, the devil still has to give account for what he does on this earth. Now, everybody in church goes, yeah, amen. So let me say this. That means that nothing happens to you without God giving the devil permission for it to happen first. That wasn't quite as loud an amen. We're okay with the devil giving account. Sorry, sucker needs to give account to God. But we're not okay with the fact that God knew what was going to happen to us before it happened to us. Then it makes us start questioning divinity and how much he loves us and how can we have a loving God, Miss Becky, and he allow this to happen to me. And the scripture says that the sons of men that came before God. And the scripture said, the Lord said to Satan, whence comest thou? How many of you like the fact that God is sarcastic? Three of y'all didn't even realize. The rest of y'all didn't even know that. I said, did you know God is sarcastic? He has a sense of humor. I looked in the mirror this morning, Miss Luttrell, and I realized God has a sense of humor. <laughs> I was getting dressed, and I said, you are really hilarious. He has a sense of humor. He does. He laughs at our calamity. And the scripture tells us that God asked some no duh questions. Did God not know where Satan had been? Somebody help me out. He knew where he had been. He asked these kind of questions because he wants the people he's asking them to, to realize where they are. He said, Satan, hey, buddy. Where are you coming from? I know where you've been. Do you realize where you've been? Same question he asked to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Adam, where are you? He knew where Adam was. He wanted Adam to realize where Adam was. He said, where are you coming from? Whence comest thou, devil? He said, from walking up and down on the earth. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? Now, we might look at this and say, impressive, impressive. God told Satan, look at this guy. He's an impressive Christian. Can I be honest with you this morning, Brother Scott? I don't want God pointing the devil to me. Everybody okay? Congratulations for Job, but I don't want God looking at me and saying, Hey, consider Josh, don't point me out. Everybody all right? Don't do it. He said, Have you considered Job? He's a great guy. He's upright. He fears me. And let me tell you the cliff note of what happened. The devil said, Oh, yeah? Of course he fears you because he's filthy rich. Everything in his life is awesome. I'm giving you a cliff note version, all right? Everything's great. He has healthy children. He has a ton of them. He has money, donkeys, camels, material possessions. He has a big old house. He lives in Beverly Hills, 90210. I mean, the guy has everything. Yeah, God, he loves you. And let me tell you what God says. All right, fine, devil. Take everything that he has. And I promise you, that guy will still serve me. Now, the first time he put a stipulation on it. He said, take everything, but don't take his health. The second time when Satan comes back, he said, go ahead, take his health. He'll still serve me. Somebody help me out. He said, just take it all. He'll still serve me. So let me tell you, Cliff Note, Cliff Note version, the worst day in history happened to one man. 
You're like, I had a horrible day this morning, preacher. My eggs were burnt. Tried to go to the Waffle House. I couldn't get a seat before church this morning. Sunday school teacher didn't have donuts. The coffee wasn't hot, and the seats are a little warm in here. I mean, it's just been a bad day all day today. Shut your mouth. This is the worst day in history happened to one guy. He loses everything he has, and then all ten of his children die in one tornado accident. Read it. I'm telling the truth. Read it. It's in there. The Bible says a great wind comes up, collapses how? All ten of his kids dead. The Bible said it was so much bad news that it happened on time. Has anybody ever got repetitive bad news? Miss Cheryl's the only one of them. Anybody ever got repetitive bad news? This happened in succession. One servant said, hey, man. Oh, he's out in the field, and the donkeys, they're all dead. The Sabians killed them. While he was talking, he said, hey, man, the Chaldeans fell on the camels. They're all gone. While he was talking, he said, hey, man, all you sheep, they're all gone. While he was talking, the last one said, hey, bro, I hate to tell you this, but an East Texas tornado just came, and all 10 of your kids just been pronounced dead. In a matter of minutes, this guy loses everything he has. Everything. Now, I'm not, I'll get to the part about how he doesn't curse God with his mouth and, he, and he's wonderful and he does all the right things. But that's not what I want to focus on this morning. I want to try to help you this morning. I want to try to encourage you. How many of you in the house have ever been? You're going to have to be honest this morning, okay? You're going to have to take your church clothes off and you're going to have to be honest. Everybody okay? How many of you have ever looked up to heaven and asked God why? Now, the other 25% of you who's lying, you'll be with me by the end of the sermon. Everybody okay? How many of you have ever looked up to heaven and said, God, I don't understand that? Have you ever looked up to heaven and said, God, that doesn't make sense? The title of the message is this, The Puzzle of Life. The Puzzle of Life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your many blessings. Lord, I don't know who needs this. Maybe I need it. I don't know, but Lord, I know this is what you want me to preach this morning. You gave it to me on the way to church this morning. Father, I pray that you give us the Holy Spirit. We need it this morning. We need it, we need it, we need it. I can't preach it. Lord, I pray that you bless us this morning. Your precious and holy name we pray. And the church said, uh, amen. You may be seated this morning. How many of you have ever heard the story of Job before? Raise your hand. You heard the story of Job before? Good. Most of you are there. I'm not going to rehash it. How many would would you agree this morning that this is the worst day in history happened to one man? Anybody in the house? How many of you be honest and say, preacher, I've had some bad days, but I've never had a bad day like Job had a bad day? I've had some bad days, but this guy had the worst of all bad days. This would be like somebody calling you, Miss Becky, and say, listen, somebody stole your identity, and they done ran up $2 million worth of debt. And the phone ringing while they're on the line saying, oh, by the way, your bank accounts are empty. And the phone ringing saying, the banker said, oh, by the way, your house is foreclosed on. And the phone ringing while that's happening say, hey, all your sons and Andrew just died in a car accident. This is the worst Andrew's laughing about that. There's something wrong over here. (laughs) This is the worst day in somebody's history. Now, we can all brag. We can all talk about Job and say what an incredible individual because the Bible says, and this is awesome, and we'll get to this, but the Bible says that Job, he rent off his clothes and he put ashes and sackcloth on his head and he kneeled down before God and he said, naked came out of my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of God. And the church said, Amen. It's a great story. But the truth is, after Job doesn't curse God, after Job doesn't cuss him out, after Job doesn't ask the question, after Job praises God, the Scripture says in the next ten chapters that Job goes into a minor state of depression uh, asking the hard question of why did this happen to me? Now, you're going to have to visit this morning with your inside brain and get rid of what's all comfortable. And you're going to have to ask yourself the question. You have to answer it. Have you ever looked up to heaven before and said, God, why? 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 Why did this happen? Was married for six months. My wife was pregnant. Came home one night. And I heard some gurgling. I went into the restroom in our 
little apartment in Little Rock, Arkansas, and my wife was laying in a pool of blood. She was pregnant. She was only a few months pregnant. This is prior to Micah and Mackenzie and our wonderful children. And she's a few months pregnant. She was gurgling blood. And I thought she was dying. I had no idea what to do. I was newly married. I, I'm a young kid. I don't have a clue about anything, really. I grabbed her up and I ran her down and put her in a little Pontiac Sunfire that we had. And I jammed it in drive and I drove to the local hospital and we sat for two hours. The doctor kept coming out and he said, I don't know exactly what's wrong and this and that and this and that. And I think maybe she's ruptured this and ruptured that. And finally, we got somebody that knew what they were doing, Dr. John. He came in and said, sir, your wife's having a tubal heptopic pregnancy. And the baby's in the wrong place in the fallopian tube. All Greek to me. I had no idea. I'm like, dude, you have to speak English. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. He said, the baby's not in the right place and it's grown too large. It's ruptured the fallopian tube. Now she's bleeding internally and she's lost a lot of blood. We're going to have to take her into emergency surgery. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. I've been married for six months. Associate pastor at a church, youth director, music guy, Mr. Do-it-all, clean the toilets, whatever needs to be done, trying to serve Jesus. I get to the hospital. They say, hey, go ahead and tell her goodbye. She's out of it. Did the best I could to say goodbye. I went to the waiting room and waited. We lost the baby. We didn't lose the baby. I know where she is. Somebody say amen. amen. I didn't lose her. I'm sorry. Got into the worldly terminal. I didn't know. I know where she is. She passed away. Wife barely made it. I thought, why? 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 Now I know you're way more spiritual than I am, and you deserve to be up here today, and I know you've got all the answers to life, and you get it, and you understand the puzzle, but there are times in this old preacher's life where I look at things and say, that doesn't make sense. Four years ago, a lady who's a good friend of mine, Miss April Little, calls me, and she said, Preacher, she's eight months pregnant. Some of you know April. She's eight months pregnant. She says, Preacher, I went to the doctor. There's no heartbeats. She said, the baby's dead. She said, I'm too far along to have a DNC. I'm going to have to deliver. Prepped the baby, and we got to Wiley Hospital, and I sat through eight hours of delivery to deliver a corpse. They took pictures with the mom, and I get to Memorial Garden Cemetery, and there's a little white box about this big. And as I'm standing over top of the box, All of a sudden, the hand of God taps me on the shoulder and says, do you remember? Do you remember? This is why that happened. Do you remember that night? Yes. Do you remember the tears you cried? Yes. Do you remember the pain you went through? Yes, I do. This is why you went through that. You couldn't see it then, but I knew what was going to happen. Somebody help me out. Do we not serve a good God, yes or no? But sometimes the truth is we just look up to heaven and say, I don't understand. This is a Rubik's Cube. How many of you like doing this kind of stuff? You're weird. (laughs) My, uh, I know, Brother Dennis. I'm praying for you, brother. I don't know, man. My kids, they, some of my kids, Micah and my kids, they love playing with these stupid things. I hate them. I saw this in the car the other day. Mallory's like, Dad, can you close your eyes and put this thing together? I said, Mallory, if I had a diagram and six hours and a YouTube video and both of my eyes were wide open and I was hyped up on coffee, I still couldn't do it. And she said, well, I'm really good at puzzles. I said, well, congratulations. I'm really bad at puzzles. I don't know how they work. I don't know how to put them together. And you know what I thought about? In life, we as human beings, sometimes we're bad at the puzzle of life. I mean, y'all got to get, some of y'all are honest and some of y'all are really hurting today. And I don't know if you just don't want to help me out or what. I said, sometimes we have to look down and say, you know what? I'm really bad at this thing called life. I'm really bad at this puzzle, Miss Becky. I'm really bad. I thought I knew exactly what was going to happen, and I wake up, and I'm more confused today than I was yesterday. 
I'm more bewildered today by this thing called life than I was six years ago. I'm more confused by this thing called existence than I was when I first got saved. I thought I had some things figured out. And the longer I live, the more I know that I really don't know that much at all. And I, I don't understand the puzzle. It doesn't make sense. I started looking at this Rubik's Cube this morning, Dr. John, and I just dotted down a few things that correlate with the scriptures here. Number one, obviously on a Rubik's Cube, you're supposed to match all the colors up. Yes or no? Yes or no? Oh, thank you. You know what that is. You're supposed to put all the colors together, right? You know what I keep looking at, Brother Dennis, when I'm looking at this? These don't match up. I cannot get them to match up. Let me ask you a question this morning, and please be honest. How many of you have ever looked at God and said, you know what? Things in my life don't match up. Amen. Things in my life don't add up. Things in my life, they're not copacetic. They don't all look the same. They're not all on the same page. Ooh, ooh. Let's stay right there for a minute. How many of you have ever realized that you're not on the same page with God? Huh? Huh? How many of you have ever looked up and said, that doesn't make any sense. This is what I thought was going to happen. And you're on a totally different page in what feels like a totally different book. And this doesn't match up. Did you see verse number one? Miss Carolyn's got it. She's got it. Did you see verse number one? The scripture said he feared God. He was upright. He was honest. He was a sacrificial servant. He loved the Lord. He eschewed evil. And yet, in the meantime, all hell broke loose on Job. Y'all look right up here. Why can we not pay attention when people are moving around? I do not understand. In a movie theater, you can stay glued to the screen for three hours and not go pee. And you can't pay attention for five minutes with somebody. Look right up here. All hell broke loose on Job, and he was serving God. Now, I'm going to need some real Christians in the house to help me out this morning. How many of you have really been serving God and stuff happened to you while you were serving God? And you looked at your life and said, that, really? Are you serious right now? That doesn't make, I know some of y'all are like, you know what, preacher, you're kind of disrespectful. Is that really how you talk to God? Yeah, that's really how I talk to God, okay? I don't know if you know this, but God is my best friend, okay? And I hate it for you that he's not yours, but God is my best friend. And in the morning times when I get frustrated with God, I look up to heaven and say, are you kidding me right now? This is where we are? He said, well, I would never say that. Oh, yeah, you might not with your voice, but guess what? He already knows your heart. So you might as well come clean because he already knows what you're thinking. Somebody help me out. Well, I would be kind in the way I spoke to him. Yeah, he already knows your heart. Everybody okay? He knows. You ever serve God and said, you know what? That don't match up. Think about Miss Becky over here. I keep picking on her, but she's one of my best friends. And last week, man, she's praying, and she's in charge of our prayer ministry here at the church. Man, all kinds of stuff happens to her. Like literally every week, Miss Becky calls me, and something else has happened. She fall off a tractor. Last week, she got bit by a black widow. Who gets bit by a black widow? She got stuff running all up her arms, three days in the hospital. I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, who does this kind of stuff? It doesn't match up. Trying to serve God, trying to live for Jesus. And look at Brother Vic over here and Miss Lana. Within a week, within a week, double surgeries, weeks at the hospital. These two precious people are wonderful Christians, serve at our church, help with our ministries, and yet they're going through all this. It don't match up. Somebody help me out. Everybody okay? You ever look up to heaven on a Monday morning and say, God, this don't match up. I know what the preacher said yesterday. I know what he yelled. I know what he screamed. I know what he talked about. But this doesn't match up. Look at Rudy back there. Man, you look at Rudy on a Sunday night. Man, we have praise and worship. Rudy be the first one down here. Don't raise your arm. It probably hurts. But Rudy be the first one down here. Raise his hands. Praising God. He got gloriously saved. Been praying for his family. I mean, this kid's got a story. He's got a testimony. And we see how he trips and breaks like four bones in his arm. Where at, preacher? At church. Upstairs. 
That don't match up, does it? What's the deal? Job said, I don't understand. I've done everything that you asked me to do. I try to raise my kids right. I try to pray. I go to church. I sacrifice. I tithe. I give. I live right. I skew evil. And all this happened to me. This don't match up. You got to get real. Somebody got to get real in the house. Everybody okay? It don't match up. The colors don't match up. When I look at that Rubik's Cube, it doesn't look like it's supposed to. It looks all jumbled up. Let me ask you a question. You ever looked at your life and it looked all jumbled up? About five of you. You ever looked at your life and it looked all jumbled up? Can I say something? And I know I'm probably going to hurt your feelings this morning. The problem with church people is we get our stuff together and we forget about when our life was jumbled up. I'm going to say that again. The problem with church people is we meet Jesus and we get our stuff together and we forget about when we didn't have our stuff together. See, I just stay right. I'm going to stay right. The problem with us is we get gloriously saved and we forget when we weren't gloriously saved. The problem with church crowd is we get right with God and we forget when we were very unright with God. Somebody say amen. amen. The problem with the church crowd is we start tithing and we forget what it was like when we weren't tithing. Everybody okay? The problem with the church crowd is we get semi-obedient and we forgot when we was a rebel. Amen. Then we start judging people because we forget about when our life was a jumbled up mess. Mm. Everybody okay? Remember one day I was out knocking doors. They like to use a fancy term around here, evangelist. It makes me sound important. I'm not. I'm just a loudmouth who chooses to talk about Jesus a whole bunch. Everybody okay? I don't only have one spiritual gift, talking. A lot. I like it. I was out knocking doors one Saturday, banging on people's doors. Phone rang. It was my neighbor. He said, Josh, where are you at? I said, I'm trying to get people in church. He said, you need to come home. I said, I'm not coming home. He said, you really need to come home. I said, why? He said, your house is on fire. I said, what? I said, how bad is it? He said, just please come home. Drove around the corner. Four fire departments were in there fighting that fire in Maude, Texas. I drove around the corner, Miss Donna, to see my roof collapse on the inside of my house. Firemen running out the sides of it. It was front page of the paper, fire and ice. It was in February. It snowed the day before, melted all the ice in our yard. Front page of the paper, Mod, Texas, 2624 and Highway 8 South. I walked through that burning rubble, and you know what I said? Are you kidding me? Oh, I know. You're more spiritual than I am. I said, Are you serious? I'm out trying to get people out of the fire, and you send the fire to my house? <laughs> I'm out trying to get people out of hell and you're turning my house into a burning hell. I know you're way more spiritual than I am. I'm standing in my sunroom looking at all of his melted toys and I thought, are you kidding me right now? I'm tra- trying to save the world for you and you can't even keep my house safe. Amen. It's too real this morning, huh? It's just too real. This ain't pie in the sky preaching. This is just hit too close to home. You know what, Brother Scott? I said, this doesn't match up. It doesn't match up. That made no sense to me. Job said, this puzzle of life, it doesn't match up. Number two. I'll go quickly. Number two. Sometimes when we're dealing with the puzzle of life. Oh, watch this one. Oh, I wish you'd get this. Sometimes when we're dealing with the puzzle of life, it looks very hopeless. About six of you said amen, about 20 of you rolled your eyes. The ones that rolled their eyes, I know I've been there. We've all been there. I would take that over the amen. How many of you say, preacher, sometimes it looks hopeless? I worked on this a little bit for Mallory. You know what I said, Brother Danny? This is stupid. I'm not wasting any more time on this. I'm not getting figured out. I don't know the answers to it. I don't know how it works. And I'm not wasting any more of my life trying to figure out this puzzle. And then I started saying things like this. This is impossible. Oh, oh, 
That one got you. This is too hard. About three of you. Everybody okay? This is too difficult. This is ridiculous. Oh, you've never said that thing about your life. This is too hard. I don't... Ooh. How many of you, be honest this morning, this is going to take some real honesty. How many of you have ever not wanted to wake up tomorrow because the things you were involved in are too difficult? Amen. Said, you know what? I hope the sun doesn't shine tomorrow. I hope Jesus does come back. I hope he does take me home because this thing called life is too hard. It's too difficult. It's too impossible. It's hopeless. I can't figure it out. You say, well, Job never got there. You didn't read your Bible then, did you? Job has three friends. And by the way, they're not very good friends. With friends like these, who needs enemies? They're terrible. They show up and start berating Job. You know what they're saying? Point number one, this doesn't match up, Job. You must have a lot of sin in your life, sir. You must be the biggest hypocrite on the face of God's planet because, sir, if you was really loving for Jesus, then this stuff wouldn't happen to you. Paraphrasing, but that's what they said. And then Job starts throwing a pity party, Charlie Brown style, man. No, nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat some worms. Anybody okay? Anybody ever thrown a pity party? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to say that again. That's where everybody says amen. Anybody ever thrown a pity party? Anybody ever thrown an epic proportion pity party <laughs> where we start exaggerating everything about life? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Been there. You're like that far shy of a straight jacket. Somebody help me out, right? Good yeah, amen. I know it is. <sighs> it's terrible. Everybody hates me. Nobody understands what I'm going through. It's the worst. Nobody loves me. It's the worst. Ah! It's hopeless. Job said, curse. But then she said, curse be the day that my mom was told that she'd have a man child. Man. Curse be the day that somebody told my mom that she was pregnant with me. You say, preacher, translate that. I wished I'd have never been born. <laughs> That's pretty tough right there. Anybody ever said that? Ooh. Probably been better if I'd have never been here. Let me break it down for you some other ways, that things that we may have said. Probably have been better if we'd have never met. Who yeah. is quiet? Probably have been better if we'd have never got married. Probably have been better if we'd have never got this job. Probably have been better if we'd have never moved. Probably have been better if we had never been parents. It's quiet. Sometimes the puzzle looks very hopeless. In the middle chapters, in the meat chapters of Job, Job's throwing a pity party. You read it. It's great reading. He said, I, I, it's impossible. Can I say something right here? Just encourage you a little bit because the last point is going to be encouraging. I promise you're like, well, I sure hope so, preacher, because I'm going to have to leave here and go take a Xanax, man. This is terrible. <laughs> like it's Sunday morning. I got the whole rest of the day. I'm completely depressed now. The last point would be encouraging. Let me help you, okay? We serve a God that deals with impossible things. Amen. We serve a God who has a specialty. He has a doctorate in difficulty. Somebody help me out. Amen. We serve a God who specializes in miraculous things that the rest of us say, this is too hard. I can't understand. And God says, are you kidding me right now? What did he know about that? Oh, nothing. He took a drunk and created a boat that ended up saving humanity. Three of you even know what I'm talking about. Noah had a drinking problem. Now he did not. You just don't read your Bible. I said Noah had a drinking problem. He took a skid row drunk and built a boat that saved humanity. Somebody help me out. He took a stuttering, introverted murderer from Egypt and delivered Israel across the desert. Yeah. That's not Moses. You don't know the whole story then. Let me help you out. He took a woman of the night named Rahab and put her in the lineage of Jesus Christ. 
Oh, y'all really didn't like that one. That hurt your feelings, didn't it? That touched on the church nerve, huh? That got to you a little bit. He took an eight-year-old kid named Josiah and purged Israel of its idol worship. Eight-year-old kid. Who in the world would elect an eight-year-old the president? And this cat turned Israel around. Eight years old. He took a teenage boy with a slingshot and defeated the most powerful warrior of his time. Y'all, do y'all know these stories? Or you just heard them so much that they're just, they're just dull to you? Everybody okay? He took a cussing sailor named Peter and helped evangelize the entire known world. He took two prideful brothers named James and John who only cared about their ego and started the first church in Jerusalem. He took a zealot named Simon that had so much Roman blood on his sword it wasn't even funny. And he preached the gospel all across the known universe. We serve a God that knows how to fix the puzzle. Six of y'all. You say, preacher, I know this puzzle of life is difficult. It doesn't match up. It's hopeless. Can I help you out? And we're done. I'm going to help you. Brother Dennis, do you know why I can't fix these? You ready? Number one, I don't have the patience for it. And number two, are you listening to me? If I would have ever fixed one of these and seen what it looks like complete, maybe I would try to fix another one. But I've never seen one of these that I've tried to fix completed. Can I help you out this morning? The reason why your life is a puzzle is it's not over yet. You've never seen it completed. (laughs) Miss Becky, I, I don't know what else there is for me. I've never seen the completed version. So some of it still looks foggy and some of it still looks unclear. And some of it still looks confusing because I've never seen what it looks like complete. I don't know. I've never seen it. Say, preacher, you don't understand where I am. You're right, I don't. I'm not going to pretend to. Say, preacher, you don't understand what I'm going through. You're right, I probably don't. Preacher, I don't know how to fix this. This puzzle doesn't match up. It doesn't look right. It's all jumbled up. I don't, what I can tell you is this, the puzzle's not over yet. If you woke up this morning and you took a deep breath, God's still working on the puzzle. Man, three, somebody, somebody, somebody get a spiritual bone in their body and understand that the little song we used to sing in children's church is still good for us at at adult church. You ready? He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. But I'll be patient. Just wait and see because he's still working on me. The puzzle's not complete. Here's the problem. We want to know what the ending of the story is before it's over. Come on, come on. How many of you ask if the movie ends happy before you watch it? How does it end? Well, what's the, what? Why am I going to tell you that? Because I ain't watching it if it's a sad ending. That's why some of you only watch Disney movies. Because at the end, everybody's happy. You don't like them real life stories where sometimes the bad guy wins and people die. You don't like anything but fairy tales. Well, life ain't a fairy tale. And the puzzle is not complete. Kilgore, Texas, 1972. 
Four young men at the Kilgore Assembly of God on Stone Road were youth department buddies. They were juniors and seniors in high school. They drove a 1970 Chevelle. They had the world at their fingertips. They were getting ready to graduate and go to college. Church kids, their parents were all deacons and elders at the church. You listen? Right up here. Listen. On a Sunday afternoon, they were good old redneck country boys. That's where you say amen. Somebody help me out. They had guns in the back of their uh, car, and at the end of service, they were going to go shoot some guns down at the river. Somebody help me out. Freedom of air, right? Everybody out. They were just going to go enjoy some afternoon. They got down with church, and they drove their Chevelle down to the river bottom. They had just drilled a brand new old Derrick platform, and they had sealed it off. What they didn't know is there was a gas leak, and it had formed a 150-foot gas pocket in the river bottom. If you don't know what a gas pocket is, it is one of the most flammable, explosive environmental hazards known to the old field. The workers had all gone home. It was the weekend. The young man pulled up. They had no idea. They opened their doors and they slammed the metal. You remember when cars were actually made out of metal? They slammed the metal door and a spark. The river bottom went up in flames, exploded. There was a man on the hill that was watching it from a little white frame house, and he said that two of the boys literally went up in flames and fell in the river, and they died immediately. Another one of them was trapped in the car, and the last one ran into a thorn thicket, and he was tangled up, burning to death. The man grabbed a blanket, ran down, and fell on top of the young man, put the flames out, took him to the ER, and he died two hours later. It rocked Kilgore, Texas, at that time only having about 11,000 people in it. It was the front page of the news. There was hundreds of people at the funeral. It was the funeral was at the local high school. It was a tragedy. My dad was just a young man. He was only about 12 or 13 years old. Do you know how many people... Hey, look up here. Do you know how many people ask why? Do you know how many people looked around and said that doesn't make sense. The parents took their life insurance policies from the young men and they built the only thing that the church did not have, a gymnasium. They named it after the four boys and they began to host youth meetings on Friday nights in honor of those four boys. They would have dinner and a game and volleyball and basketball. Look up here, look up here, look up here. They'd have pizza, and they'd preach, and they'd talk about the things of God. And the four deceased boys' names and pictures were on the front of that gymnasium. And one Friday night, a strung-out dope head with long, stringy blonde hair who was high on weed stumbled into that gym and heard the gospel. His name was David. And he's my dad. Six weeks later, my dad stumbled back into that gym with his girlfriend and heard the gospel again. He began to attend on Friday nights because he liked to play basketball and eat pizza and hang out. Eventually, they got him on a Sunday morning and Jim Holyfield preached about hell. And my dad got saved at the age of 17. That gym still exists in Kilgore, Texas. Every time I go back, I drive by that little stone structure. The names of those boys are still on the outside in their pictures. It doesn't make sense. I don't know if I would be here today if not for the puzzle that we call life. It's not over yet. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Say, preacher, I can't figure it out. Can I help you with something this morning? And you can talk to some of the, as Brother Dennis so eloquently put it, chronologically gifted people in the room. You know what they're going to tell you? You're not ever going to be able to completely figure it out. 
Say, Brother Josh, it don't match up. I know a lot of people in this room, and I know a lot of people that hurt in this room. I've done funerals of people's children in this room. That went way too early, before their time, before their parents. And I watched them struggle with their faith because the truth is that we're supposed to say that we believe and we trust. But the truth is we look at a grave marker and we say, that doesn't make sense. I've been in a room with people that have lost their family members in this room. Family members to cancer and emphysema. And I say all the right things and I quote the verses that we're supposed to quote. But the truth is, we both look at each other and want to ask the question, why? Why does this puzzle not match up? Sometimes the truth is only God knows. But I promise you this, he's working it out the way he intends to work it out. Romans 8, 28 is a wonderful verse. One that we often misquote and misinterpret. All things work together. Are you listening to me this morning? Heads your bowed eyes are closed. Listen to me. He didn't say all things are good. He said all things work together yeah. for good. We somehow think when we got saved that our life was going to become some sort of a Dairy Queen commercial with ice cream sandwiches and smiles and plenty of Coca-Cola and we'd always have money in the bank and health and things would be good. The truth is, Jesus said, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Truth is, he told the disciples, don't take, don't take thought of food or raiment. Where are you going? I'll take care of you. The truth is, life sometimes doesn't make sense. Preacher, what am I supposed to do? That's where faith comes in. I may not have faith in life, but I do have faith in the one who gave me the life. I may not have faith in tomorrow, but I have faith in the one who holds tomorrow. And the truth is the puzzle's not done yet. This morning, if you need prayer, or if maybe you're trying to figure out the reason you're even here. Maybe you're asking the questions of whether Jesus even loves me or whether... He wants to be my friend or even help me with my puzzle. Let me answer that for you. Yes and yes, he does. He loves you very much more than anything, more than his own son. He was willing to give him up. Jesus gave up his own life for you. He loves you very much and he wants to be your friend. He wants to help you with the puzzle. If you'd like to know that, if you'd like to accept that this morning, we'll be here. But maybe you're a Christian and you say, Preacher, life is just not matching up. The colors are not the same. The puzzle is confusing. It's not over. It's not complete. Hang on. Jesus is working it out. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, bless us today. Go with us through the invitation. Lord, I don't know what people need this morning, but we all need you. So, Father, I pray that people do business with you as only you can. We thank you for loving us. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You can stand.